Imagine that sitting over there is a menorah. Just make believe, okay? So what does the word menorah mean? It's another word for Hanukkah, which actually means the eternal light of God. So I think that might apply to Jews and Gentiles, yes? Okay, so what is light? In the natural, it is, nat it is energy combined with matter. Spiritually, it represents life. In the Bible, when the Lord asked Israel to put a visual representation of him in the temple in Jerusalem, he had them shape a Hanukkah, or menorah. <clears throat> this is a vessel in which to burn the eternal light. It was to burn continuously and never be put out, symbolizing that he is eternal and can never be extinguished. So biblically, light means the divine holy light of eternal life, who is God. So what exactly is darkness? It's very interesting because darkness isn't even a thing. Only light is. It's the absence of light. So quite simply, it's the absence of God both naturally and spiritually. The absence of light, therefore, is darkness. And if light is life, then darkness is death. Throughout the history of Israel, the Lord has used his nation of Israel continuously as a metaphor for con understanding who he is and what his plan for humankind would be. The reason why he used Israel was only because it was the only nation on earth who ever cared enough to have a relationship with him. Not because they were special, although that kind of makes them special. But even Israel had many missteps in her walk with the Lord, and he still does. God used these missteps for his purposes, of course, to show those who cared to look deeper what his plan for man would be. The missteps of Israel throughout history shows what happens when darkness overtakes light. When Joseph's brothers grew jealous, darkness covered their hearts and caused Joseph to be sold into slavery in Egypt by his own brothers. For over 13 years, Joseph was a slave and then a prisoner, wondering that whole time when the Lord would bring his prophetic dreams to fruition it was a time of darkness over his life, I'm sure, that he probably thought would never end. Have you ever been in that place? I most certainly have. But God keeps his promises, and the dream was fulfilled for Joseph. And he didn't even punish his brothers. He showed mercy. Now, if that's not light, I don't know what is. When all of Israel were slaves in Egypt, there was a great darkness over the nation. The scriptures tell us that for 400 years, the people prayed and wailed and cried out to the Lord for mercy and justice and freedom. Every time I hear that word, I think of the movie Braveheart at the end, when they're killing him and he screams out, freedom! <laughs> I love that movie. Have you ever been in that dark of a place, thinking to yourself, why doesn't he hear me? Why doesn't he bring my deliverance? I have, and still do, many times in my 47 years of being a believer. Imagine that you are a 50-year-old man or woman slaving in Egypt, tired, broken, ready to give up, ready to just die. And then one day, it's the 364th day of the 399th year of Israel's captivity. Could you imagine what that must have felt like? I, I can't even begin. You don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring. Do you give up? Do you wake up the next day in despair that you would have to do it all over again? 
I don't know about you, but my life definitely feels like that a lot of times. That's what happened that day. And lo and behold, somewhere around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you look up toward the horizon and see something coming toward your town in the desert. It looks a little like a figure of a man, but you can't quite make it out, so you just ignore it. Eventually, he comes closer, and you find out later it was Moses. He was returning from the desert after 40 years. Imagine what Moses felt like. And he is the deliverer. He is the light coming to illuminate your darkness. Wow. I, I can't imagine. Could you imagine if you gave up in year 398 and just said, that's it, Lord, take me, I'm done. <laughs> you only had two more years to go. I feel like that a lot. I'm sure you do too. In 147 BCE, Israel was once again, for the numerous time, taken captive by another nation, forced to renounce the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, forced to become Greek-speaking and follow the Greek gods and Greek culture, forced to clothe themselves in the darkness of a nation who followed witchcraft and demonic practices. Hmm, sound familiar? But the one thing that the enemy doesn't remember, for some reason, he's, I don't know, is that the Lord always, always saves himself a remnant of humans who love him and revere him in spite of all the darkness in their present lives. There's always a small, tiny ember of light under those ashes, those dark ashes. Looks like there's nothing there, that it's dead. But underneath, there's this little tiny ember. And when you least expect it, whoosh, God fans the flames in one of those remnants' hearts to start a new fire, a fire of repentance and return to Adonai, to the Lord. And so Judah Maccabee and his family became that flame, which then ignited the fire of faith in the hearts of all of Israel to rise up and dispel the darkness, praise God. Get rid of the enemy, take back the land, take back God's holy temple, and rededicate it to the Lord in Jerusalem. They set up the Hanukkah back into its stand to defy the enemy and show him that the Lord is Lord, and he is the eternal light that can never be extinguished. But there was a problem. There was only enough oil for it to burn one night because the Greeks had trashed the whole temple. <laughs> no, nope. no problem for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Israelites lit the light in faith that the Lord would provide. And of course, he did. It miraculously burned for eight nights. And that is the miracle of Hanukkah. In 30 AD, when Yeshua the Messiah began teaching and revealing the scriptures to all who would have ears to hear and eyes to see, you need light to see, many of the nations of Israel listened. Many of the nation of Israel listened and heard and believed. It was another one of those times during which Israel was being held captive by the Roman Empire. The people were crying out to the Lord and wondering if it was time for the promised Messiah to come. Well, it was, but only a remnant knew it, and they only half understood it. They only understood stood half of what was meant in the scriptures until the Messiah gave them the eyes to see the light after he was crucified and resurrected. They understood that Yeshua the Messiah had to die for the sins of all mankind once for all in order for the law to be truly fulfilled and that anyone who had this faith would become spiritually alive to God for the first time in their lives and would have the promise of eternal salvation. 
This remnant became a light, a Hanukkah to all the nations for 2,000 years. All the nations of the world. And, though, and although for that 2,000 years, the rest of Israel, the majority of Israel, had their eyes closed and they were still in darkness concerning the Messiah. He, make it, he had made an eternal covenant with Israel that a remnant would always return and be saved through belief in Messiah Yeshua, a remnant of Israel. And as we believers are all aware, this began to happen when Israel became a nation again, and especially when the words of our Messiah himself came true, when Jerusalem is no longer trodden down by the Gentiles, then will the end come. That happened in 1967 when Jerusalem was taken over 100% by Israel. And that's also when Messianic Judaism or first century Messianic Judaism came, rose its head again and became a revival in the Jewish people of which I'm one because I was saved in 1971. So when your heart is weary and crying and lonely and hopeless and in pain and anguish, remember these stories and all of the other stories in the word where Israel was lost and captured by other peoples, sometimes lost because of their own undoing, as is true with us. Yeshua says, oh, sorry, and eventually they triumphed, of course, in God's glory. Yeshua says, faith as small as the tiny grain of a mustard seed. If you've ever seen one, you won't believe how small it is. But the point he was making is, it can still move mountains. Mountains, I've seen it with my eyes. Just as an ember, burning out under that big pile of cold, dead ashes can cause a flame to grow again, or a mother or father's heart that is ready to give out and give up on their child who is lost and in pain because of the disease of addiction or has already lost their child to that or any other disease, or a spouse who has lived being terribly emotionally or physically abused for years, or a child wondering if their parents will ever love them and accept them. Yeshua says, don't give up. If there's one tiny ember left, ask him to fan it into a giant flame of fire, and he will, to your peace and his glory. He will help you rededicate your temple back to him again. Have a blessed and happy Hanukkah.